Welcome everyone to Medicine Grand Rounds. We're going to go ahead and get started um, with a fabulous speaker today, who many of you know, Dr. Kirsten Vivens Domingo, who's going to be talking about disparities in chronic diseases and the health of young adults. So, uh, some things uh, that you might be interested to know about Kirsten. She is a professor uh, in residence in the Department of Medicine and also has an appointment in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics. She did her undergraduate training at Princeton, uh, an MS in chemistry in Nigeria, followed by a PhD in uh, biochemistry at UCSF, an MD at UCSF, and a master's in clinical research at UCSF. Kirsten is very well trained. <laughs> uh, in terms of some of the amazing things that she does, so her research interests are in the prevention and treatment of heart failure and other cardiovascular diseases, um, emphasizing racial disparities in disease incidence and outcomes. Uh, but she has a national and international presence. So just a few of her accomplishments. Um, she's a member of the American Society for Clinical Investigation. She's a member of the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force and has talked with us um, about some of that work. She's also been a member of several Institute of Medicine committees um, and recently uh, has been chair of an NIH, uh, NHLBI uh, study section. Um, and that is just a small uh, smattering of uh, what Kirsten does um, and, uh, and additionally is director of the UCSF Center for Vulnerable Populations. So we're just delighted to have you today and uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you for that nice introduction. Hearing all those degrees always reminds me that my mom was really happy when I finally got a job. <laughs> um, okay, so we're going to talk about disparities in chronic disease and the health of young adults. And here are my goals for this talk today. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, to just lay out the problem for you. Um, not to talk about solutions necessarily, but to lay out the problem and to reframe what many of you know about chronic diseases through the lens of um, thinking about what it means to care for young adults with chronic disease. Um, and in that context, I want to talk about and highlight two new research efforts that are um, being housed in the Center for Vulnerable Populations, um, two center grants from uh, the NIH um, that really uh, has funded us to embark upon a, a, a nice multidisciplinary set of collaborations uh, to both conduct research and to uh, disseminate some of that research related to chronic disease and the health of young adults. So, chronic diseases, as you all know, common, costly, and deadly, right? So, this is the leading cause of death and disability globally and in the U.S. And I want to emphasize globally because whether you are living in a low or middle income country or a high income country, the most likely thing that's going to kill you is one of these chronic conditions. And the big four chronic conditions that we talk about are cardiovascular disease, cancers, pulmonary diseases, and diabetes. Recently, um, there is an expanded definition of chronic conditions, including arthritis, which is probably the leading cause of disability worldwide, um, mental health, which um, is an important chronic condition that is often left off of this list and hasn't found a home in uh, the priorities, um, and so is rightly put into the list of chronic conditions, as well as other conditions that start out as infectious, like HIV, hepatitis B, and C, which end up as chronic conditions and uh, can be debilitating in that way. So whether you use a restricted definition or an expanded definition, it really doesn't matter because this is still either by a, strict defi a, a restricted definition or an expanded definition, the leading cause of death and disability worldwide. Seven out of 10 deaths annually in the US are from chronic diseases, and heart disease, stroke, and cancer account for more than 50%. Nearly one out of two adults have at least one chronic condition. Three out of every four healthcare dollars are spent on chronic conditions. And an important aspect when we think about this category of, of diseases is that there is an important element that's largely preventable or modifiable with attention to risk factors. And the most common risk factors and important risk factors as outlined by the World Health Organization are healthy diet, physical activity, uh, tobacco, um, uh, tobacco, and, um, and uh, moderate um, alcohol use. So, 
when you look at that list of chronic conditions, it of course strikes you that these are the conditions that rise with age. And so chronic, it should not be surprising that chronic diseases are important in the US. We have an aging population in the US, and so of course it makes sense. You die of something, and eventually you die of your heart disease or your lung disease, and that's what's put on the death certificate. But what's challenging and what's sometimes not um, completely well understood or appreciated is that both globally and in the US, there's a substantial burden of chronic illness in those under 60. So globally, 25% of the chronic disease deaths occur in people under 60, and 90% of those deaths are occurring in low and middle income countries. So in countries that we think about um, infectious disease epidemics, rightly pay attention to those epidemics, what kills people in those countries is still the chronic diseases. In the US, the premature burden of chronic disease disproportionately affects racial and ethnic minority populations and poor populations. And the poor populations, obviously there's some overlap between these things, but the poor populations are important because regardless of race, ethnicity, the fact that I told you those modifiable risk factors um, sit quite clearly at risk in those upstream social determinants of health. The poverty puts you at risk for um, uh, lack of access to poor uh, diets, uh, physical activity, those types of things as well. So, I want to tell you the story of how I became interested in this topic, just to put it in context, and then we'll talk about um, what, uh, what uh, shifting a chronic disease epidemic to younger adults means for how we think about prevention and treatment. So this is a patient I had when I was an intern, Mr. F. And I was an intern on uh, cardiology here. And he uh, was a gentleman who, he didn't listen to his wife when he started having chest pain. And he came to the emergency room with essentially a completed infarct. He came in, we took him to the cath lab. Um, he, uh, they couldn't do any types of interventions because he had completed his infarct. He was left with, um, substantial heart failure, and he had a, a pretty substantial coronary heart disease, three vessel disease as well. Um, he spent several days in the ICU. He was eventually transferred to the floor and then became a patient of mine. Now, Mr. F was a UPS driver. He was actually from the southeast of the United States. Um, he had moved to San Francisco for opportunities here. Um, and had done very well, and actually had this wonderful nine-year plan for his retirement, because he was going to move back with his, uh, his kids were mostly uh, grown by this point, and he was going to move back to the South uh, with his wife, and, uh, and had that whole thing planned out. But unfortunately, because of this, um, this cardiac event, and the resulting heart failure, and the eventual diagnosis of diabetes, uh, Mr. F was not able to return to work. Um, he went from going, having no medications to all of a sudden being on probably eight to ten different medications for his heart disease and his heart failure. Um, he was unable to work. He eventually became quite severely depressed and had to be treated for his depression. He, over the course of this, developed some diabetes and, um, and uh, quite debilitating, quite debilitating. Um, his wife, uh, found it very challenging to take care of him. And so, um, several years ago now, uh, we admitted him to Laguna Honda. And we admitted him to Laguna Honda when he was 43. And this entire event uh, took place when he was 37. So, poor health is a challenge whenever it happens, right? But you can imagine uh, when some things happen in an age where many of us in this room are, that the difference and the impact on life, on um, a community, if more of chronic illnesses happen at younger ages in those communities, both for individuals, for families, for community structure, for the economic health of a population, can be pretty substantial. So I became interested in Mr. F because of the impact on his life and on those around him, but um, I also became interested because it was pretty clear that this was not an atypical presentation. So Mr. F was African American, um, and what we showed um, uh, a few years ago now was that uh, heart failure in young 
adults happens more commonly in African Americans. This is a study of 5,000 uh, black adults and white adults followed for over 25 years now. Uh, they began when they were age 18 to 30, and over this 25-year period, um, African American men and women develop heart failure, um, although, and the whites do not. So over the course of this study, one in 100 black men and women develop heart failure, and this is heart failure before age 50. Blood pressure in their 20s was the strongest predictor of developing uh, heart failure among the blacks who developed it. And development of diabetes in the 20s and 30s was also extremely important. As you know, heart failure is one of the most uh, uh, debilitating of, of the, the chronic cardiovascular conditions, as it was in the case of Mr. F. When one thinks about black and white disparities in cardiovascular disease, it's often cited that blacks are more likely to have cardiovascular disease. It's well known that this disparity exists. But when you look at where the disparities actually occur, the disparities are things that happen during this young age period. So this is the black versus white ratio. Anything above one means that blacks are more likely to have uh, the range of cardiovascular conditions. And you can see here, if you were studying older adults, there wouldn't actually be a black-white disparity. The disparity really is at this younger age group. So if you're trying to address disparities in cardiovascular disease, if that's your goal, you need to actually pay attention to the excess disease that's occurring here, um, in addition to obviously doing the things that we all want to do in terms of preventing disease that happens here. If you look in San Francisco in particular, San, uh, the Department of Public Health has paid a lot of attention to the causes of premature mortality in San Francisco. And these are the excess um, life years that are lost. So deaths that occur before we think they should occur. And these are the leading causes of death among men in San Francisco. If you look here, these are the leading causes in all of the age groups. African Americans here have the highest premature mortality rates. The rates in other groups are lower, but in all groups, ischemic heart disease is the most common cause of premature mortality in San Francisco. Um, I put this here because when you think of premature mortality among men in San Francisco, particularly if you're interested in racial and ethnic minority populations, you probably think of HIV, you probably think of violence and drugs, um, all of those are on this list, but ischemic heart disease is at the top, and lung disease, cerebrovascular disease, hypertension are in the top list here. If you look at the same list in women in San Francisco, heart disease is again number one. Trauma and drugs actually moves down this list, and they're replaced by the cancers. So again, in San Francisco, uh, reinforcing the idea that the chronic, the causes of premature mortality in San Francisco uh, are these uh, ischemic heart disease most prominently, and then these other diseases that we've talked about, lung disease, stroke, hypertensive disease. So I've said that this doesn't, uh, not only causes burden to the individual, to the families, to communities, but there's a clear economic toll uh, that affects not only communities, but really affects um, affects uh, th this entire country. So if we talk about, this is some work that we did early on talking about uh, examining what happens when you shift a burden of cardiovascular disease to younger ages. Where are the excess costs associated with that shift? So some of that is that more people have to go to the doctor, right? If more people have heart disease when they're younger, that costs more in direct health care costs. But the, but the greater cost to shifting this burden to an age of the population where people should be working um, and uh, otherwise contributing to our uh, domestic product is, uh, is uh, the, uh, the cost of wages lost due to premature death and the cost of wages lost to disability. So these burdens, these dollar numbers are much greater than actually the cost in aggregate uh, that's associated with the increase in health care costs. So, when poor health begins earlier in life, what has to happen if we want to prevent this? What has to happen if we want to address this? It means that those of us who are interested in prevention have to think about targeting, targeting prevention earlier, right? We think a lot, a lot of the, our strategies at prevention, because we, we uh, work in clinical settings, focus really on who comes in to see us, and the people who come in to see us are not young people, they're older people. So when we focus on prevention, we are not getting the people who we're trying to prevent disease here. 
for the people who come to see us, who come into our clinical setting, we have to also shift our awareness to understanding the risk associated with um, the risk of chronic disease developing in younger people, to have an eye open for that. We make guidelines, we think about the health of populations for what the population mean is, which tends to be an older shift. So how do we understand what, uh, what it means to prevent and adequately treat chronic disease in a younger age group? And then finally, uh, we need to think about the biological factors that contribute to earlier and sometimes more severe presentations of this disease. Um, it's easy to say that this has to do with um, uh, um, risk factors that develop earlier in life, but oftentimes for many of these conditions, there are important interplays um, with biological factors that must also be understood to understand uh, um, the contribution of early presentations. Heart failure is a good example. So, let's just think about young adults now for, for a second. What does it mean when we, if we wanted to focus uh, a prevention effort in a young adult period? How would we think about what would be the challenges to doing that? Uh, what makes it different than targeting a prevention or a treatment program or a screening program for a population that's 50 years old? So, one challenge here is that communication about health and risk in adolescents and young adults is, is challenging, right? So this is the group we call the young invincibles, right? Um, we know from HIV, from other communicable diseases, that talking about risk, talking about uh, disease uh, prevention, health promotion to young adults who may be more impervious to risk, um, it, it may be more challenging. And uh, um, how do we talk about that when the risk is uh, not something that's going to kill you right away, but rather is going to kill you slowly over time. What are the venues that we can use to talk about uh, uh, health promotion and disease prevention? This is not, as I said, often happening in the doctor's office. Where can it happen? What are the venues where young adults are um, uh, able to think about, to talk about uh, health and disease, and uh, how can we uh, take advantage of places where they are being seen in order to, to continue to further these efforts. We're challenging the young adult period because younger, young adults have lower rates of health insurance and lower provision of preventive services. So this is a uh, nice work that's, uh, that's been done by uh, this group really showing uh, the, the risk in both the adolescent and, and then in particularly the young adult population here. So these are the annual visits in females on the top and males on the bottom. Um, and you can see that, uh, that young adults actually have the lowest rate of, um, of ambulatory services. Um, women, we've shift, shifted here a little bit more uh, than men. In both of these groups, you have waning health insurance. And then you also have, uh, in women, you have uh, visits Oftentimes for, um, for reproductive health uh, care visits, um, that's what causes the shift to be slightly different. But in both cases, you can see both in this 10 to 19 age and the 20 to 30 age, uh, this, this real dip in, uh, in ambulatory care visits. There is a corresponding rise in uh, emergency room visits in this age population, in those age groups. And unfortunately, the emergency room visits really speak to what is that burden, that unmet need of managing and preventing chronic illnesses because most of those emergencies or a substantial portion of those emergencies are not actually for uh, what, what we would think of as true emergencies. They are things that should be addressed in the ambulatory care setting. Additional challenges are that the organization of medical care for prevention and treatment of chronic conditions is really, again, not optimal for youth and young adults. There's lower awareness among clinicians and uh, again, as I've said, important to meet patients where and how they seek their care. So, um, I talked with you here about the challenges of young adults. They have low perceived risk, they have low receipt of ambulatory and preventive services, they have low rates of health insurances. This will change under uh, the Affordable Care Act, but, um, but uh, still we are, we are still gonna be playing catch up for what has been uh, low rates of, of access to health care because of this. I've talked with you about minority populations who have a younger age, at an onset of chronic disease, a high burden of chronic disease risk, and low rates of health insurance. 
And so we're here at this intersection. So you've shifted in many minority populations to younger age at disease onset. We have this that exists really in all uh, young adults. And so if you're trying to prevent a chronic illness and you want to have an impact on uh, disparities in chronic illness, you're really at this intersection of trying to understand what we can do to have with interventions that can actually target this particular population. So, uh, young adults also provide many opportunities as well. So, developing approaches to health promotion and uh, chronic disease prevention in youth and young adults has the potential to yield considerable health benefits. You have the potential for setting, um, setting up prevention early enough in life for preventing a whole range of chronic conditions, um, of promoting health that will have benefits for, for decades because it starts early. You have the additional effect of potentially having an impact on the next generation. So this is a population that, that has children that uh, will be hopefully uh, setting up the same types of health um, environments for their children. And so an impact in this population has the effect potentially of, uh, of benefiting the health of the next generation. Um, again, as I mentioned, the focus in this age period is important because if we don't, it's going to be challenging to address uh, the disparities, racial and ethnic and income disparities in health. And um, what I think is an intriguing uh, aspect of focusing on this area is that it's a relatively understudied area. And so the hope is here that we'll generate new knowledge on how various factors intersect to promote health and cause disease. And so that's what I'm going to talk with you about now. I'm going to shift gears and talk with you about our, uh, uh, the work that uh, is currently just beginning um, as a part of CHARM. CHARM is the Center for Health and Risk in Minority Youth and Adults. This was a five-year uh, Center of Excellence grant um, that was awarded from the National Institutes of Minority Health and Health Disparities. And um, this is the goal of CHARM. CHARM is a transdisciplinary center, and you'll, I'm going to return to this piece as well for the study of minority and chronic disease risk with a focus on youth and young adults. Our goal is to generate new knowledge on the interplay between biological, behavioral, and social determinants of health and chronic disease risk in our population, to partner with community organizations in the Bay Area to improve health literacy related to health promotion and chronic disease prevention in this population, and to build capacity in health disparities research on chronic disease, particularly among underrepresented minority research investigators, minority investigators conducting research at UCSF and at San Francisco State. So I'm going to focus on the three research projects within CHARM. These are the ones that we highlighted in this proposal. But we have a, have a broader interest, which we're going to get to as well. And so for each of these, I'm going to give you a little bit of background in the type of research that's going on. So um, asthma is one of our uh, chronic disease conditions that we focus on. Now asthma is a chronic condition that occurs in young adulthood, right? Or in childhood, that's when it, that's when it occurs. Uh, it's hard to say that this is premature, um, but it is an important and debilitating chronic condition, and in fact is the most common chronic condition um, among uh, children. So that's why it was an important part of this proposal. There's a lot of variation, as you'll see, in asthma. And so asthma offers us the opportunity to study, really, what biological forces put some groups at risk for asthma and asthma severity, and uh, what types of environmental factors intersect with biological risk uh, to, to uh, prom uh, promote disease. So this is a project that's led by Esteban Bouchard Gonzalez. Um, he has the largest study of minority children, Latino and African American children, and he's interested in the genetics of asthma. But what he's become increasingly interested in is the intersection of early life exposures, exposures to air pollution, to poverty, understanding the roles of acculturation at critical points in time, healthcare access, and how these intersect with genetics of asthma to make some groups particularly vulnerable to uh, the disease and to worse outcomes from the disease. So as I said, asthma is the most common chronic condition in American children. Um, it is, uh, affects many, many, many millions um, and is associated not just with uh, poor health in children, but also missed school days for kids and missed work days for their parents who have to take care of them. And so associated with uh, a great um, uh, cost burden as well. 
If you look at the asthma prevalence in the U.S., and these are from the seven slides, uh, you can see that um, Puerto Ricans have the highest prevalence of asthma, African Americans the next highest, and interestingly, Mexican Americans um, the lowest here within this, these four comparisons. And what Esteban's work is really focused on is really trying to disentangle what it is when we, we oftentimes will um, lump uh, Latino groups together, Puerto Ricans and Mexican here, but, um, but there is clearly quite a difference in the presentations of asthma uh, depending on whether one is of Mexican origin or Puerto Rican. When one looks at the mortality rates from asthma, again, uh, you see the high rates in Puerto Ricans, but you also see much higher rates in African Americans compared to their overall prevalence. Again, here, low rates in Mexican Americans and Caucasians. So here, clearly, there's something uh, that's associated with worsening asthma in these two high population groups uh, that puts African Americans at higher risk compared to um, what, what might, one might expect by prevalence. Within CHARM, Esteban's group is focused on the intersection of asthma and obesity. Both asthma and obesity disproportionately affect um, uh, low-income and minority children. There are some evidence from other studies that there's a shared genetic effects of asthma and obesity, but prior investigations have really focused largely on older populations. They've not considered childhood events and exposures um, on the emergence of asthma and obesity, and have really not focused on minority youth. So a settlement group is really nicely poised to actually start to explore some of these uh, both genetic and biological factors and how they intersect to put um, uh, put uh, certain groups at risk both for obesity and for asthma and poor asthma outcomes. Really in collaboration as a part of CHARM and uh, the extensive work of Esteban's group um, in continuing this has led to uh, some very nice network, uh, network of uh, community-based uh, clinicians who are caring for minority children with asthma and now a grant application for improving asthma management to minority children in the Bay Area. That will include both Shannon Tyne here, um, as well as uh, other um, uh, clinicians who are involved in innovative approaches to asthma care. And this effort is being led by one of the <coughs> fellows in the Stephens Group, Nita Packer, who many of you know. Another of our research activities focuses on tobacco. Tobacco is probably the single most uh, clearly identifiable, modifiable risk factor for chronic disease. So uh, smoking cessation, smoking, preventing people from starting to smoke is probably one of the most important things that we can do uh, if we want to curb the burden of chronic illness. Um, these are efforts led by Pamela Ling, and so Pam is interested in social interventions to curb tobacco use in young adults. You all know that the tobacco companies spend lots of money uh, to market uh, to uh, continue to both increase or at least maintain the audience of smokers. If you've been following in the news recently, the the um, the marketing to children with uh, the flavored cigarettes or the different type of cigarette products. These are really important efforts of the tobacco country, uh, companies to maintain that smoking base. Pam's approach is to actually use the strategies of the industry against them to try to make it cool not to smoke, essentially. Um, and uh, she has done some very innovative work um, and is now going to be expanding this uh, to uh, minority populations. Here's what smoking looks like. So um, uh, you can see here that even among middle schoolers, you have some prevalence of smoking. And then if you look at high schoolers and young, adult, young adults, this is the group that is smoking. And obviously, uh, you know that if we can prevent people from smoking in this age group, we have a high likelihood that they will never be smokers. In the US, every day, more than uh, uh, 3,800 kids try their first cigarette, and over 1,000 become daily smokers. Um, nearly 90% of smokers' first cigarette is before age 18. Those who don't start by age 25 won't. Um, and of every three young smokers, one will eventually die of a smoking-related cause, and most youth, youth smokers want to quit. And clearly, tobacco marketing drives some of youth smoking. When we think about this through a disparities lens, you can see here that smoking prevalence is, 
is um, pretty substantial overall and still we're low in California nationwide but still this is not an insignificant smoking rate and the rates though among race ethnic minority populations um, are, are higher in many groups. African Americans are uh, have a greater impact overall in terms of smoking related diseases and death. American Indians in California have the highest prevalence and the highest rate of heart disease and certain subgroups among Asians and uh, Latinos actually have a very high prevalence too, mostly among men. If we look, um, you're more likely to be a smoker if you're poor, you're more likely to be a smoker if you're less well educated. And of particular interest to Pam and her group and us as well is that uh, the high rates of smoking among LGBT youth is, uh, is much higher than uh, among the heterosexual smoking youth. So here's Pam's approach, and um, uh, she, so tobacco companies do actually a lot to, um, to actually sponsor parties um, as a way to get young people to start smoking. So they are part of the uh, whole promotion of these parties, cool places to party. They are part of the advertising of these parties. Um, and it, it is an important way to uh, continue uh, to perpetuate um, smoking as, as sort of a, a part of, of being young and obviously cool. Um, so, and, and these are just two examples of a, a typical ad that you might see in, in different cities, Detroit, Los Angeles, Atlanta. So, um, uh, so tobacco industries have these bar promotions and they focus, they have a very explicit uh, focus here on social leaders. Um, they are trying to target a small but very influential group, a, a trendy group, and they're looking at the, the thought leaders within these populations and they rely on image and association in their advertising as they target these groups. These are from the, some of the tobacco papers from RJR, really showing how the industry focuses on these groups. And here's, here is you know, the quote here. They're looking for uh, the group that is stylish, very active, love the nightlife the big city has to offer. These people are trendsetters themselves. They're the ones who got iPods and TiVos back when none of us understood why we needed them. They're the thought leaders. They often serve as brand ambassadors, oftentimes recommending new smokes to their friends. So this is clearly a strategy of the tobacco company to try to uh, get smokers and to, uh, to really uh, hone in on the, the thought leaders, the trendsetters within these groups. And so what Pam's group is doing is to basically take the uh, uh, approach of the tobacco companies and actually uh, to use the exact same type of approach to market not smoking. And so working with uh, two organizations now, they have um, really uh, um, developed an approach to, to sponsoring, promoting smoke-free parties and um, with these types of, of marketing. Uh, Commune is one of these groups that promotes smoke-free party, and you can see the images they use are very much um, like uh, the images that a tobacco company might use to market the, the other approach. Verge is another of these. And what Pam has done is shown that, um, that uh, th this approach is actually very successful at reducing smoking rates in certain cities. And uh, the cities that she's done this in, they've re really focused on um, mostly hipster culture, mostly, a, um, mostly white culture. Um, and what she hopes to do in this project is to try to see how uh, she can develop the same type of marketing approach, which is a very, uh, very intensive um, uh, approach to, to try to understand really what's going on within the cultures, within these subcultures. Um, but to do this uh, within populations that are, are not going to be targeted with, the, with her prior focus on uh, the mostly white hipster culture here. So this, uh, so in Charm, she uh, hopes to develop and uh, test novel tobacco control interventions to address disparities and reduce smoking among young adults, 18 to 25, attending bars and clubs in the SFA area. And she's building on a social intervention uh, that she's previously shown to reduce tobacco use in other cities. All right, diabetes. So those of us interested in chronic disease, diabetes is the big one, not because it's the most common, but because it's the one that's rising. 
And it's the one that's rising. If we don't get ahead of it, it's the one that will continue to make all of the other chronic diseases more challenging for us to deal with. So within CHARM, we have several efforts really focused on diabetes. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Margaret Handley and her research project to uh, reduce um, diabetes risk among uh, women with a history of gestational diabetes. And then uh, diabetes is a major focus of our community-engaged dissemination efforts, um, uh, efforts aimed at diabetes prevention. And these are led by Dean Schillinger and Cherie Boyer, who's in pediatrics. So uh, type 2 diabetes accounts for 95% uh, of diabetes cases. It used to be found only in adults, but is rapidly increasing among young adults and children, especially in urban settings, in poor neighborhoods, and in communities of color. This is what it looks like in California. And you can see here, the trend numbers will tell you why we're interested in diabetes, right? In every group you see an increase between 2000 and 2007, right? These are substantial increases across the board in all these groups. Um, and then uh, particular uh, populations are disproportionately affected. American Indians, African Americans, and Latino being uh, the highest uh, prevalence populations. So rising and minority populations disproportionately affected. Uh, the scary thing when one looks at uh, the view from pediatrics and all of us who think about young adults from the internist point of view have to look at what's happening in pediatrics first. So the data from pediatrics is that one in four youth ages 12 to 19 have prediabetes. Ten years ago it was one in 11, right? So that's, those are really quite shocking numbers. Now not all of these, these uh, teenagers are going to develop diabetes. But the estimates are that 50% of them will uh, develop diabetes within five years. So 50% of African American youth overall and 33% of Latino youth will contract type 2 diabetes in their lifetime. That's compared to 25% of white youth. And here's another way to think about this problem. So if you were a pediatrician and you saw diabetes in your practice, you used to be seeing type 1 diabetes. This is the pediatric population, and this is what, pe what diabetes looks like in the pediatric population. The purple is type 2 diabetes, right? So if you, have, if you are seeing African Americans, Latino, Asian Pacific Islander, American Indian populations, you're seeing lots of type 2 diabetes. That's the disease you're, you're taking care of if you're treating diabetes. Gestational diabetes is a type of diabetes that develops or is diagnosed during pregnancies, and it affects between 7 and 18 percent of pregnancies in the U.S. and is on the rise. Although this is a condition of pregnancy, women with GDM are seven times more likely to develop type 2 diabetes after birth than women who don't have this condition. In addition, there's the additional intergenerational risk of children of moms of, with GDM also have a high diabetes risk. Who gets gestational diabetes? Here, this is um, really every non-white group, with the exception of African Americans, actually has higher rates here. So Mexican-born, uh, Asian Pacific Island, Asian Indian, Chinese, Southeast Asian, um, Filipina, and this is from the California Kaiser DDM study. So really, um, really considerable rates here in in California. Margaret Hanley is leading a study um, uh, uh, looking at uh, ways to prevent type 2 diabetes. So a challenge with gestational diabetes is that uh, gestational diabetes takes place at a time when women are really in care, right? Um, because they have diabetes in their pregnancies, they oftentimes have doctors paying attention to them. But postpartum, when we're talking about managing diabetes risk in these women, that's a time uh, when there's both challenges and opportunities. There's challenges because these women are uh, falling through the cracks of our sort of fragmented healthcare system. If they're cared for by OBGYNs, they're not necessarily thinking about ongoing diabetes risk management. Um, they may not be seeing an internist as well. Um, they might not be seeing anybody because they might return back to normal blood sugars and not be seeing anyone. Um, but there's also the opportunity because if we have, if we are able to educate women about 
uh, the approaches to diabetes prevention, if we're under, able to understand how to support women in diabetes prevention. These are highly activated women potentially because, um, because they've just given birth, they're interested in the health of their children as well. But they're not necessarily inclined to go out of the house to come to see the doctors or to come and talk with us about these efforts. And so what uh, Margaret has developed a really nice uh, project here to use automated telephone self-management support, uh, delivering health messages, health promotion messages via the telephone uh, to uh, these women uh, who've had a history of uh, gestational diabetes. This builds on a prior uh, successful interventions uh, that Dean Schillinger has led um, and uh, is really translating those now to the prevention of diabetes. And Dean has shown very nicely that these work uh, in all populations, but in particular for those with limited literacy or limited uh, English proficiency, um, also benefit from these this type of approach. She's focusing on Latinas in Sonoma County and in San Francisco. Uh, Dean's work uh, has really led us to a, a really fabulous collaborative effort with Youth uh, Speaks as one of our community partners. Um, and uh, I'm sure all of you, or hope most of you, have been able to attend, I think a year ago, Dean's uh, Grand Rounds with Youth Speaks, uh, looking at uh, um, uh, having youth poets themselves generate uh, the, the health promotion messages. And it's been really a, a really lovely uh, partnership. And, um, and if you have a chance and you want to see the full public service announcements from uh, the Bigger Picture uh, campaign and Youth Speaks, our collaboration with Youth Speaks, I urge you to go to the website to take uh, if you haven't seen them already. Um, I think part of the real joys of doing this type of work is actually working with organizations that work with um, youth and young adults because when you can engage them in this process, it's really, I think, quite extraordinary the things that come out of it. We also have a partnership with Youth Radio, and um, uh, Youth Radio actually, um, interns there are the ones who developed our logo. Um, this is our charm logo, and uh, uh, this is what, um, uh, the two interns who developed this logo uh, said of uh, their inspiration for this logo when we talked about what we were trying to do in this center. And uh, we thought it was quite nice and sort of uh, epitomized their take on, uh, on um, what it means to think about uh, health, uh, health promotion and disease prevention in this young adult period. All right, so other CHARM project components. We have a training core that's uh, interested in integrating health disparities concepts throughout UCSF training programs and improving the mentorship and outreach for those studying health disparities. We have a research core that's really interested in understanding the role of place in uh, the prevention and management of chronic disease. Um, so we know that place matters. and. Uh, and so mapping where these different community interventions are taking place in the Bay Area is really important. And we have an administrative core that oversees all these projects. Um, Christine Dellendorf and Alicia Fernandez. Um, uh, Christine is in family community medicine and Alicia uh, in general medicine uh, have been leading these efforts in our training core. Um, uh, Bob Hyatt, who's the head of Department of Epidemiology, has been really leading uh, the sort of mapping efforts in the research core. And then I'm forever grateful <laughs> to Purva Chatterjee and Dr. Gurley, who uh, keep all the things running um, in, this, in this very uh, complicated project. This is the team. The th big joy of doing this type of work is that we've really brought together pediatricians, uh, internists, OBGYNs, epidemiologists, people who think about risk communication, community, uh, community members, um, people who are thinking about uh, young adults in other types of contexts. And I think, uh, I, I think what's been exciting is just the, the interest and enthusiasm for thinking about this particular topic. And uh, we hope this is just the start and we'll continue to expand to think about this idea um, and this, this age period in, in sort of interesting and creative ways. I want to quickly, in the last few minutes, talk about a, a related but different project um, that came along at around the same time. This is our Dyad Center, which was funded by the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. Dyad's is a collaboration between Kaiser Permanente, Northern California, and UCSF. 
And I'm the joint PI of this project with Steve Sidney at Kaiser. The other, uh, uh, the Kaiser is wonderful if you ever work with them. So, you know, those lovely Thrive campaigns, they, they, they do a lot figuring out what's the best way to communicate something. So they, they renamed this, which is very academic, worthy to bring it down, which is now the theme of our, our project here. So the goal of dyads, or bring it down, is to improve blood pressure control in African-American patients, to reduce disparities in the temporal trends and known risk factors for stroke in young adulthood, as well as identify novel factors that may contribute to stroke risk in young adults, and specifically disparities in risk. And then to disseminate these findings to community practices and to train both health professionals and community clinic leaders in primary prevention of stroke in African-Americans. So um, you may not know this, and I didn't know this until a few years ago, um, but stroke rates among young people, here we're defining young as 25 to 44, are actually on the rise in African Americans and in Asian Pacific Islanders. So this top line is African Americans. Asians is in here, they have lower rates overall. But the concerning thing, both when Kaiser looked at their data and when others have looked at their data, is that the rates are actually on the rise. And this is in contrast to ischemic stroke rates in every other age group, where they're actually either stable or falling, right? So it's only in this group that somehow we have more stroke. Uh, we have more stroke and more stroke specifically in these two populations, and we have a higher burden of stroke overall in African Americans. So again, this focus on the young adult period. You might have heard, and because. Uh, um, Kaiser's very nice work in achieving blood pressure control was highlighted in a JAMA study that came out last month. And so this is looking at the experience in Kaiser from 2000 uh, over this decade, essentially. And what you can see here is uh, the rates of control of Ki in Kaiser Permanente and for hypertension, and these are the control rates everywhere else. So they're doing a really remarkable job. They're really good at controlling blood pressure. They have a wonderful protocol system that takes blood pressure control really out of the hands of doctors and puts it in the hands of pharmacists and nurses and anyone who sees and touches a patient knows how to move through the next step in, in giving the next uh, medication. And they have a nice four-step system and I encourage you to read this article because it tells you that control rates of 80%, which is what they have in Kaiser, are achievable. But even within Kaiser, they have these dramatic disparities. And the disparities that are dramatic are here in this youngest age population again, the youngest age adult population. And this is 18 to 39. You see these remarkably high control rates at these other older age groups. And in this age group, you see this gap. Um, you see lower rates of control among those who have hypertension. And you see particularly lower rates among uh, African Americans. And so again, for a system like Kaiser that really has the ability to mobilize an entire system to tackle an effort, they like these 80%, but they don't like this, right? And this again feeds into how do you get, how do you think about systems to achieve better risk factor control, and how do you think about systems that adequately target this particular population, which uh, for many reasons is, is harder to reach, right? Um, so Kaiser has initiated a, the Bring It Down intervention. This is a pragmatic randomized control within Kaiser to determine whether primary uh, prevention intervention of, uh, it's a three-arm trial of diet and lifestyle coaching, intensive pharmacotherapy versus usual care. And usual care in Kaiser includes this protocol uh, step for managing blood pressure, but adding these in addition to it will improve rates of hypertension control in blacks, focusing particularly on those in the younger uh, age groups. And this is a, a nice, very complicated intervention led by Mon Nguyen, who many of you know was here at UCSF and is now at Kaiser. Kaiser also had this, uh, this grant also has an observational study where um, we're interested in really determining whether there are novel factors that are at play and in, in, in related to the high rates of stroke in younger, uh, in younger adults. Um, what is the role of race, the role of atherosclerotic risk factors, and the role of novel risk factors in the early presentations of stroke? And Heather Fullerton, uh, who's a, neuro a pediatric neurologist here, is leading uh, these efforts. 
We have a research and training core, which will work with the research and training with the training core in Charm, and we also have a, a modeling core, a research core that um, uh, that will working on on uh, helping to look at the impact of these types of interventions if expanded nationally. So here's my summary uh, from this little whirlwind tour of chronic disease. The burden of chronic disease is great, and, a, and it is a substantial contributor to disparities in health. Presentations with chronic conditions earlier in life poses particular challenges, but also opportunities. Addressing the early stage and the onset of chronic conditions is essential for addressing disparities. Research is necessary, and I want to highlight here, uh, this is all types of research, basic, translational, clinical, community-engaged, as well as policy-related research on how best to address uh, what is the range of things that put people at risk from the biological to the behavioral to the social determinants of health. These efforts are necessarily multidisciplinary and they require creative thinking by all of us. And by all of us, I, uh, I really mean all of us and with that I would like to invite you to uh, some of the, uh, the a new seminar series that we're launching at CVP. Uh, so, the Center, Center for Vulnerable Populations is interested in chronic illness. Um, we are focused on this young adult period because of these grants, but that isn't necessarily our only focus. We are focused on the projects I mentioned, but that isn't our only focus. In fact, much of what's done at CDP is not even part of, of these grant activities. But we'd like to engage all of you in the discussion for what it means to think about innovative ways to both prevent and treat chronic disease with a particular focus on the populations that are at risk. And so we'd like to invite you to uh, these interactive seminars to be part of this, uh, this platform to exchange ideas, share knowledge and best practice and bring together, uh, as we bring together hopefully experts with some, some content knowledge as well as your own knowledge and experience and ideas. So CVP is actually just a block and a half down from the hospital on uh, 25th and Petrero. And on the first Monday and the third Friday of the month, this time in the afternoon, this time in the morning, we'll be having seminars. Um, if you'd like to be on our listserv, the listserv sign-up is at the back. You can also go to the CVP website and get more information, but we really encourage you to come and uh, take part. These are our upcoming events. So on September 6th, that's this Friday, we'll be screening a film a place at the table with a panel discussion led by Hillary Seligman on food insecurity and the role of food banks. Many of you heard Hillary's outstanding grand rounds several weeks ago, and so you know about uh, the importance of food insecurity and chronic illnesses, and this is an outstanding uh, opportunity to both screen this film and to engage in this discussion. Hillary and the rest of CDP invite you to take part in the Hunger Challenge, a week in collaboration with the SF and Marin food banks uh, to challenge you to try to live on food stamps and the amount that, uh, that uh, many of our patients live on. And please, we invite you to check out CVP website for the details. We launch our series uh, um, in Friday in two weeks with a talk by Claire Brindis, who's the head of uh, the Institute for Health Policy Studies. Um, she will be talking on an Institute of Medicine uh, collaborative meeting on improving the health, safety, and well-being of young adults. And October 7th, Rochelle Dicker in the Department of Surgery here will be talking about community violence prevention programs. We're interested in all topics. We're interested in your ideas. We're interested in you joining our discussion. And so we hope to see some of you there. Questions? Comments? Simona Zolfi of NALA at the Center Hello. for Youth Wellness. Hi. And uh, I was wondering whether you'll be looking at adverse childhood experiences and association with chronic disease in the population. Yeah, so that's the interest of several of, of our you investigators. Just repeating the sure, so the question was will we be looking at uh, early childhood experiences and uh, risk of chronic diseases? That is an, an interest of, of many of us, and we've approached it in several ways. I would say probably a Stebbins group is most interested in it um, because they've asked a lot of questions. They have a cohort of, um, of, of children um, and all of them have asthma. We've also approached it actually though from, um, 
the perspective of some of the existing cohort studies um, that have long-term follow-up. I started by talking about cardia. Uh, and in collaboration, I, I worked with others in, in cardia because cardia has the advantage of having the longer-term follow-up on a, a group who were 18 when they were enrolled, and 18 they were asked about earlier childhood events. And so, you know, a challenge in this field is having um, a group study with long enough uh, with a long enough follow up so that one can really document the health outcomes. But I think that's where the opportunities are, and that's where we try to engage. In. Other questions? Thank you for your Thank time. Thank you.